Right, well, we'll make a start. So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. 8th of December, a very cold, foggy, frosty morning here in, in, uh, in West Midlands. Um, I hope you're, you're well and healthy. Um, it's a historic day. You, uh, the uh, first COVID-19 vaccine has been issued to a, uh, a little old lady. So fingers crossed, this all um, is the start of uh, uh, the, the, the new 2021. And we can hope that we're all going to be healthy uh, uh, going forward. So fingers crossed. Um, and I hope you've all opened your advent calendars and had your morning chocolate. Thank you, Drew, and morning to you as well. Nice to have you joining us, thank you. Okay, right, so I will kick off with my uh, introduction. So uh, welcome to the festive uh, virtual University of Birmingham Business Club. Thank you to all of our delegates and presenters for joining us today. Um, few housekeeping notes. Uh, we have muted all delegates for the duration of the event. If you have a question, please tap it into the Q&A box and we will get to them once each speaker has finished. If you have a technical issue, please uh, raise your hand or put it in the chat box and we will try to endeavour to uh, resolve this situation for you. Um, but we are not responsible for your Wi-Fi, so hopefully that's all good. Um, we are also recording this session and the slides and the session will be available after today's event. You can follow us on Twitter at UOB Business Club and also join our LinkedIn group where we'll be putting up um, messages and events and funding calls and all sorts of things that will hopefully be relevant. So um, without further ado, I will kick off with this morning's talks, which is on the subject of uh, the rise of the digital startup during the pandemic. Um, as you will probably have noticed, we've had quite a, a large kind of grasp of uh, technology adoption over the last kind of eight, 10 months. It's been uh, uh, a considerable rise in the amount of tech that we have adopted, but also the amount of digital startups that have uh, been created as a result of the pandemic. And it's also seen um, historic levels of research that have, have come out of universities and other private institutions, uh, and obviously uh, organizations like Pfizer have uh, really tried to bring the vaccine to the to the world in order that we can continue to uh, not be locked down. So this is an interesting time. And obviously we can't keep that peak of research up. We can't keep that kind of peak of um, that acceleration has to kind of go off at some point. So we will have uh, Henry Horde from Bohurst who will talk about digital trends. Uh, Louise Butcher, from, who's a data scientist from Hartree Center who will talk about the availability of facilities that can help companies who are starting up in the digital world, but also uh, to help companies who are looking to broaden their, um, their tech output. Um, we have Yanis Maus, who is a founder of Birmingham Tech Week, talking about the, uh, the event that we had in October, but also looking forward to uh, what the challenges are facing digital businesses during this time. And then Derek Sear from the Demand Hub, which is one of the university's ERDF projects talking about the funding that's available for SMEs within the West Midlands to support life sciences and digital startups. So without further ado, I will hand over to Henry from Bohurst, who will introduce us and um, kick off this morning's presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Henry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Henry Warwood. I lead the uh, research and consultancy uh, team at Bohurst, and I'm going to talk to you about um, two of our, our pieces of uh, data that um, speak to the impact of um, the pandemic and the, the various lockdown restrictions on startups and scale-ups and um, uh, the technology subset thereof as well. I'll speak to a bit as Kate's alluded to. Um, ben, if I could uh, quite grandly ask you for my next slide. I'm going to start by um, telling you a little bit about um, Bohurst and, and what we do. Um, for those of you who don't uh, don't know us, we're an online platform tracking the UK's ambitious um, private companies. And Ben, if I could have the, the next slide. Um, 
in order to, to track those companies, so we're, we're looking at about 40,000 companies um, across the UK, ranging from startup uh, to scale up. In order to identify those 40,000 businesses, we're looking for one or more companies, uh, companies that have hit one or more um, of these triggers you can see on this slide here. We are, to take an example, um, equity investment, which is one of the ones that I will um, talk to you about in depth today. It's um, equity investment volumes um, are a good measure of confidence in the startup and scale up um, ecosystem generally. In terms of tracking companies, we will, if you started a business today and raised 10,000 pounds from your friends and family to get it off the ground, we would start tracking your business at that point, all the way through to if you were then raising 200 million pounds from uh, US venture capitalists, we'd also track that transaction um, and that business. Um, we also look at companies receiving venture debt. We look at any business attending an accelerator, any business receiving grants from Innovate UK, Horizon 2020, um, and uh, devolved administration programs. Um, we look at scale-ups. Um, so these are companies where we can just see from their financials that they are um, substantively growing. Often they will have interacted with some of these other triggers. Um, so, so many companies have multiple of these triggers, um, but some scale-ups don't. Uh, some scale-ups are able to achieve their growth um, organically. Um, we also track academic spin-outs, companies undergoing MBOs uh, and MBIs um, as well. Um, by tracked, I mean our research team uh, creates manually, quite manually, a profile that creates and collates all of the data you would want on one of these businesses if you were, say, um, an investor or a professional advisor looking to understand, to understand a specific business or, um, or a group of businesses, which is, say, a um, sector. Ben, if I could have my next slide. So going into, um, well, as going into the lockdown, um, as we were starting to see the, the impact of COVID-19, um, we began an exercise to start looking at each of those businesses, not only in our usual ways, which was to understand um, their investment history, who was running the businesses, who owns the business, that kind of thing. Um, we then um, did a specific exercise to look at the impact of the lockdown restrictions and um, uh, the sort of wider economic environment of COVID-19 on those businesses, um, business models, to try and see whether they were adversely impacted, positively impacted, um, or anywhere anywhere in between. Ben, if I can have the next slide. So we, um, our analysts went through and looked at all of those 40,000 startups and scale-ups and applied um, as many of these tags on the left uh, as were relevant. Um, they were looking at uh, the company's own websites, any news articles about the company, the company's social media channels um, to try and um, see whether uh, any of these impact tags were applicable. And they were also inferring um, from, from the business model. You know, for example, one didn't need to, to see a tweet from, from a restaurant to know that they that restaurant would be um, closed in the um, first lockdown, this was fairly straightforward because across the UK, you know, um, the restrictions were relatively similar. Since then, we've been having to apply um, more and more <laughs> localised uh, measures um, or take into account more and more localised measures um, in the application of these impact tags in trying to understand overall how businesses have been affected. Um, the tags you got here on the left were then used to calculate um, sort of the nature of the uh, impact on your business uh, on the right here um, to sort of explain how that that might work if we could see that you were creating job job opportunities and were experiencing a surge in demand but um, you know, your your supply chain was fine or you had a digital product which meant you were able to meet that demand you might actually be having a potentially positive time um, during COVID, but actually um, in other circumstances, we might as assume a certain demand for your product, but if you were experiencing increased lead times or had made staffing cuts, 
you might actually be having quite a, quite a bad time of it, despite the fact that you might have more customers than, than ever before. So it's that, that kind of calculation that we were taking into account. Uh, ben, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, so overall, it was quite a mixed um, picture. Um, in the end, quite a large volume of potentially positively impacted um, firms. Um, and once when you combine potentially positive and low, um, you can start to see that nearly 50% nearly of the businesses um, that we were looking at here um, were, were doing all right uh, during the pandemic. Um, now, uh, okay, so part, part of the reason why I'm presenting this is those were, a lot of those were digital startups um, and the companies that were able to um, deliver their product remotely and move quite easily to, to, working, um, to working remotely. When we look at the moderate and severe companies, that's when we start to see um, more scale-ups. So um, I guess the positive and the low were largely the, the startups and the moderate and severe were the, were the scale-ups, um, which I guess ultimately just, just is, is quite logical um, that those companies with larger footprints um, had, a, had a larger task to, to adapt to, to um, remote working um, and as part of that large footprint, um, or rather part of the reason for having that large footprint is probably they were um, either delivering something physical or they had, had a reason for having such, um, such a large footprint as a company. Uh, ben, if I go to the next slide. Um, this is probably my, my favorite slide um, about how uh, the, these impacts on the, how businesses were impacted and how that played out regionally. Um, we also had, I have not got the slide, but we obviously had the analysis of which region was also worst affected. So here you can see um, the proportion of positively impacted um, companies um, by, by region. So London and Northern Ireland are darkest there. They had the largest proportion of positively impacted um, companies. And given what one knows anecdotally about um, which companies were, were likely to do all right um, during a pandemic, um, obvious ones are health tech, uh, ed tech, you know, experiencing a demand um, for a, a remote version of a typically physical service. Um, the bias in London um, isn't, isn't going to be that surprising. If it's, a, if it's a digital startup and it tells you that it's in London, you, you won't be surprised. Um, it was quite surprising to see um, Northern Ireland um, also having such a high proportion. That is, in fact, due to the um, cybersecurity hub out of Belfast. Um, these are businesses that saw an increased demand um, across the UK, but so there just is a higher proportion in Northern Ireland because as people move to remote working, um, they particularly large business moved to re remote working. There was increased demand for for more sophisticated um, uh, cybersecurity uh, products for the for the distributed workforce. Um, interestingly, as I said, we, we do have the sort of negative version of this map as well. And in that, um, uh, Northern Ireland also has the highest proportion of negatively um, impacted firms. There's no real um, sectoral trend underlying that. It is uh, ultimately just looks to, looks to have been bad luck when, when we look at Northern Ireland in particular. Um, but I guess with this, I want to show that the there are these these regional disparities in um, who had the, the the larger population of um, digital startups certainly that that were able to to adapt um, and in some cases thrive uh, during during the pandemic. Ben, if I can have the next slide. Um, so that that was I, what I was looking at was the measure from our analyst exercise of looking at the COVID nineteen um, impact. A measure that we've also always had access to is looking at equity um, investment volumes. Um, so this, this is a, a signal of investor confidence um, in the UK startup and scale-up ecosystem. Uh, ben, if I go to the next slide, please. So in order to try and understand what impact lockdown was having, we've been looking at um, the uh, period since lockdown um, and comparing it with the same calendar period um, in uh, 2019, 
Now, I've um, sort of provocatively put uh, the 2020 numbers in this um, sort of red warning light, um, well, it's more magenta, but the, this sort of warning light color. Um, whereas actually here on, on this slide, at least, uh, the, these numbers aren't, um, aren't too bad. I mean, to just be 17% down on the amount invested in 2019, given everything that's happened, um, would be pretty good, good going. This, these numbers actually only include um, straight equity deals. Um, so they don't include convertible loan note activity, um, which is the uh, instrument that the future fund uh, uses to invest in companies. So once you factor in the future fund activity into these numbers, um, we look to be at um, near enough, the same levels at, as 2019. Um, both, both in terms of amount invested and, and the number of deals. If you'd asked me in um, January, uh, as, as indeed people did, uh, I was predicting um, that in 2020, we would see significantly more invested than in 2019, um, but slightly uh, fewer deals. Um, looks like, given everything that's happened, I'll be, I'll be wrong on um, both of those counts, uh, but having effectively a flat year is, is ultimately um, pr pretty good going. With, with everything that's happened. However, Ben, if I could have the next slide. We do see um, some areas of uh, difficulty, places that are struggling. Um, and it's, it's for startups who are raising um, for the first time. So in 2019, in the period 23rd of March to 1st of December, we saw 1.25 billion invested into 397 companies. Um, in the same period in 2020, that amount has fallen by 52%, and the deal number by slightly less has fallen, fallen uh, to by 30%. So the um, the amount number, although the bigger fall is the one I'm I'm worried um, less about. There are a lot of reasons why you might have um, you might have raised less uh, during this year. You know, if you were a startup starting up for the first time, raising for the first time. Um, you might have not needed to rent um, an office space or, or spend your money on an office space in the same way you would have in um, 2019. So there are, are reasons why the, the capital requirements of your business might have changed. But nonetheless, there being 30% fewer um, businesses raising is a problem for the, for the whole um, startup ecosystem. If that continues, there's, there's no pipeline of, of businesses and it's... Um, Startups are, are are risky, so it's it's very much a sort of funnel game. You know, the more we put in the top and the top of the hopper, the more ultimately successful businesses um, there are in, in in ten years' time. So seeing a decline here um, is is quite um, quite disappointing, and um, it's something we'll we'll be keeping an eye on, it and we regularly um, put put to the government because there's no there's no sort of extra. Um, future fund activity in here. It's a requirement of the future fund that you've received at least one um, equity investment transaction prior to, to utilizing the, the future fund. Um, so the, these companies are getting no sucker from the, from the government at the moment. Ben, if I can have the next slide. Um, to, to focus in on the Midlands and to, to be able to switch from that slide to, to telling a more positive story, um, the, the West and East Midlands um, combined have had a pretty good 2020. They have already well overtaken um, their 2019 uh, investment numbers. Uh, so 180 million was invested into um, startups in the uh, East and West Midlands in 2019. In 2020, it's nearly half a billion. Now, um, 200 million of that uh, is from the um, uh, very large and sort of outlier uh, Gymshark um, transaction. However, obviously, you, you can all see that if you take 200 away from 496 million, um, it's still a significant increase on um, 2019. So thing, things looking relatively positive uh, in the Midlands in terms of equity investment. Um, so that's an interesting bucking of the, the overall trend. Um, and uh, I just thought it was interesting here to look at the, the top sectors um, in the Midlands. Um, FinTech and AI um, are, are top here. And that's reflected uh, across um, across the UK for a number of years now. FinTech has been the um, the sector driving 
um, investment uh, across the UK. Um, AI has started to catch up with it um, in recent years. Uh, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive um, either, but I, also, I, I thought this was particularly interesting because um, we rarely see robotics making it to, to number three as the, the top sector, but we, but we do in the Midlands. Um, those of you on the ground might be more, more exposed to uh, uh, robotic startups um, in the Midlands than, than, than we are. So perhaps that makes, that makes more sense to you, but I just thought that was a nice um, sort of quirky top sector to, to end on. I think that is my last slide, isn't it, Ben? Lovely, that's great. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, it's, it's interesting seeing the robotics picture as well, because that's an area of research that the University of Birmingham is heavily involved in. Um, and I know there are other universities like Bristol and Bath and Sheffield, I believe as well, that are heavily into the robotics uh, research and engaging with businesses around this area. So that's really useful to see. Um, I do have a question from uh, one of our delegates, Ian Davey. Um, how does the equity investment comparison in the UK 2019 to 2020 compare with trends in other countries, regions? So EU, USA? Um, that's that's a, a very good question. Uh, I don't have our own data to, to hand, sadly, because we're, we're um, uh, UK focused. I do know that overall the trend of it looking relatively positive um, is mirrored across Europe at least. I haven't, haven't seen um, much of the latest US data, but in, in Europe you do get um, a similar story of, of high volumes. Um, the ultimate reason for that is um, startups and scale-ups, if you invest in them as, as an asset class, you're thinking on a 10-year horizon. Um, so uh, I think most investors, um, once everyone can sort of started to see the light at the end of the tunnel, although we keep getting different estimates of how long that tunnel is, um, it is there and it, it is ultimately a short-term term issue. So if you were investing in a, in a business this early stage, um, if you couldn't see it making it through to next year, then you basically weren't that pro the business anyway, whereas what you should be excited about is what the business looks like in, in five to 10 years time. Um, and it just tells you that all investors are thinking that in five to 10 years time will be well, um, uh, well, well done with, well done with COVID. <laughs> well, indeed. Um, I've just got one more question quickly uh, from David Neller. Hi, David. Uh, has there been any changes in the source of equity investment, institutional, angel, crown fund, etc.? Um, yeah, there's there's a greater deal of um, institutional actually. So a lot of the the change in activity in my slides comparing 2019 to 2020, there a lot of what was falling away was um, angels. This is completely natural. Um, one because uh, they have the most discretion over their money. It is ultimately that just their personal money that they are investing. Um, and so they will have sort of reacted the most dynamically, if you like, to, um, to COVID-19, whereas um, VCs have to, it's their day job, to, is to, to invest um, the money. Mm. Alongside that, there's the sort of behind the scenes macro trends that, that more and more institutional money is going through VCs um, into this uh, asset class um, as well. So the, the sort of the short term pinch has been on angel funds and, and the long term trend is um, an increase in VC fronts. Lovely, no, that's great. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, and thank you to uh, the, uh, the delegates for those two questions. Um, can I also just encourage people to sign up to uh, the Bohurst newsletters? They're really, really, really useful if you are looking at data trends and uh, that kind of activity. So thank you very much, Henry. If you're yeah. able to stick around, we might have some more questions for you later. Yeah, um, now, thank you. And now if I can move over to, <clears throat> excuse me, Louise Butcher from uh, the Hartree Centre, uh, which is the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Louise, over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm a data scientist at the Hartree Centre, which is an institute of the Science and Technologies Facilities Council, which is in turn part of UKRI. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, which I'm guessing is probably most of you, um, well, next slide then. Um, we are, um, we are um, based up in Darsbury near Warrington um, 
and our mission is to accelerate the adoption of digital technologies by companies and other organizations. So we are looking to help businesses to use high performance computing, big data, AI technologies and so on. And this picture here is Scarfell Pike, our high performance computer, which is, let me get this right, the largest supercomputer in the UK, which is available for use by industry. So that is a facility that is available to SMEs and all sizes of company. Next, please. So the kind of things that we do, um, working very much with businesses, excuse me, <coughs> We do modeling and simulation, um, and that may be from physical processes to things like chemical reactions, um, optimizing code where companies already have um, their own resources. Um, so to help them to optimize that code, make it run faster, perhaps make it work on supercomputing hardware, data science and AI through collaborative programs. I'll say more about that in a moment. And I suppose bringing this all together, um, digital product design. So combining modeling with our visualization facilities, we can build digital twins of products. And in the bottom left picture here, you can see an example, which is our virtual wind tunnel which has been very successful in um, helping to design um, cars and you see here motorbikes. Next, please. So in order to look at um, what data science is, perhaps it's useful to look at what skill sets data science requires. So on the one hand, we have maths and statistics. Um, very much a sort of traditional skill, um, but very much a core of what data scientists need um, because it's, it's not enough to build models. You need to really understand the statistics behind it and the uncertainties and whether things are actually um, significant results. Computer science is the, the workhorse of what we do. We're, we're working through coding and putting those together. We've got machine learning, which is um, one of our workhorse technologies as well, training a model using data so it can understand what's important and even predict the future. But on its own, these really aren't enough um, in this day and age. We also need the other circle, which is business and domain expertise. And we can't possibly hope to be experts in every possible sector. So this is where we are very reliant on working with our commercial partners to understand their problems and their sector and to be able to put that all together to produce genuinely useful data science solutions. Next, please. So once we've, we've got this data, what sort of things can we do with it? Well, at one level, um, a company might be looking for a report, a one-off an analysis of some piece of data, and we can do that. Um, another area which is important is maybe producing an automated pipeline so that we can um, help to automate a process, make something faster. Um, and at another level, we can um, produce uh, machine learning models, which um, can help predict things in the future. Um, and I'll show you some examples of those in a moment. Next, please. So one example of um, some, someone we've worked with, um, Glow New Media are uh, small company who work in the healthcare sector and they provide a platform for monitoring the safety and effectiveness of mobile workers. The problem they had was that their um, real-time tracking system was too sensitive to GPS noise and that meant that the track jittered around, didn't give an accurate distance and didn't allow um, checking in. Um, to various locations. So we worked with them to um, implement a filter for their GPS signal and a clustering algorithm to put points together, which helped to improve the accuracy of check-in, check-out of their, their staff when they reach um, the sites that they were going to. Next, please. So more on the sort of pipeline example, then this is a good case of doing some automation to add value. Um, Roberts, Vane, Wilshaw are a firm of surveyors who advise companies on business rates. And to find potential customers, they combine different forms of data. 
So they're pulling together value, valuation office agency ratings and billing authority records, which are open data, and so fairly consistent. But they're also adding in business rate payer information, which they get from freedom of information requests. And this comes differently from each individual local authority and so needs a, a bit of um, handcrafting to get into their database. What we were able to do was to produce some config files for them and an automated pipeline so that then would automatically pull all of this data in every month um, and cope with format changes over time. And then that can extract and combine information, say, based on postcode. And we provided them with an automated way of doing this. Um, and this in turn replaced a manual process which took eight graduates, four technical staff and two managers with a much more reliable automated system of freeing up those staff to work on other projects. Next, please. <coughs> Excuse me. So another company we worked with was a company called Satsafe, who um, were based on our own um, science park, and they provide um, telematics products for fleet vehicles. So typically a camera and sort of black box sensor type of idea. And they already had a working platform. And the idea was that based on the, the sensor data, this would recommend um, possible tips for safer driving um, and sort of monitor a driver's behaviour with the idea that the sort of manager of the fleet could therefore um, demonstrate that they were um, taking into account the, the, the safety of their drivers. Um, and we were able to help them to improve their metrics so that it better reflected driver um, competence in the real world. Um, we did this by bringing in other data sources, so things such as weather data and speed limit data, and we we're able to also help them with their modelling of sensor data to assess cornering. Um, so this was quite useful because actually this is very much about, you know, the data needs to reflect the real world, and uh, that's what we were able to work with them to do. Okay, next please. Then, um, so not a small business, this is working with the NHS, um, but I think it's a good example of the kind of problems that we can help with. So Liverpool Clinical Commissioning Group are the body who oversee NHS care in the Liverpool city region. And the problem they've got is that patients often need quite complex care when they need hospital. And if that's not in place, then that patient will occupy a bed and can't be discharged safely. So what they asked us to do was to see if we could predict the care needs of patients much earlier on in their admissions process, perhaps when they're first admitted, um, in order to flag up what care they might need so that that could be put into place in advance. So we received data from them on various different areas um, such as GP consultations and appointments and hospital admissions in particular, combined these into a patient profile. And then we were able to use machine learning to make a prediction of what, um, what care needs patients would have when they left hospital. Next, please. So the first thing we were able to do actually was to visualise the pathway of patients coming through the, the hospital system. And that in itself was very useful for them because it was something that they hadn't seen before. Um, so around 83% of patients leaving hospital don't need any additional referrals. And, you know, that's that's great. They can leave without any additional care. But um, around 17% do need some additional support. And some of those patients have quite complex care needs. Now for, for purposes of visualization, I've got three different categories here, community, social, and mental health. But actually um, in the, the work we did, we had, I think 16 or 17 different categories in total. Um, and there were some quite complex cases in there. Okay, next please. Um, so once we built a predictive model, 
then we can we've got here the sort of predicted numbers on the left and the actual numbers on the right and you can see where um, the inaccuracies are. The model actually comes out to be about 50% accurate. You have to be a bit careful um, to uh, define this because um, when you um, <coughs> excuse me you've got to, because only eight, only 17 percent of people need additional care then um, you uh, have to be careful it doesn't say that nobody needs any additional care and declare itself totally accurate um, so um, we can do that and it doesn't matter if this isn't 100 percent accurate because um, it, it's only a guide for clinicians uh, next, please. I think that's everything. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, and thank you very much for the, all those case studies. That's great to show the, the breadth of the work that we can do with Hartree, but also um, it's not just um, SMEs that can benefit from, from the work, the, the facilities there, the NHS, um, MOD as well. All of these larger organisations can benefit, but obviously primarily we want to uh, get smaller businesses into using this, the facilities. Um, just uh, quickly, uh, you mentioned eDesign bespoke courses for teams. Uh, where could interested businesses go, Louise? Um, I would recommend they contact us. I think we've got Simeon, my colleague, on the yep. on the panel on here. Morning. Maybe another one to Simeon. Excellent. Yes, um, we can provide my email details uh, after today's webinar, but yeah, happy to take any inquiries. Uh, if companies do want to engage with us, um, first of all, we can operate on a commercial basis or a grant funded basis. And you know, we are on the lookout for different funding calls to help businesses uh, to, to you know, start looking at a proof of concept, um, bringing that technology into their businesses. Absolutely. And what's really helpful is uh, to start off the process as a clear challenge statement where the company is, what they've done, and where they want to go. And that really frames the context of of the challenge you're looking to address in order for me to help put the right team together and uh, arrange a meeting to, uh, to follow up on that. Lovely. That's great, thank you. And we'll make sure that uh, uh, all these slides are circulated so you've got Louise's details as well. That's great, thank you so much, Louise, really appreciate it. Right, and now if I can move over to Yanis um, from Birmingham Tech Week. Yanis, you've got uh, 10, 12 minutes. <laughs> I'll move over to you. Thank you very much. I'm just about to yep, share do my the share. screen. So Excellent. hopefully you should all be able to share my, see my screen now. Lovely. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so as Kate mentioned, I'm Yanis. I'm the kind of CEO and founder of Birmingham Tech Week and I'm excited to announce um, also the CEO of the soon to be announced Birmingham Tech. Um, so this is our kind of first public outing. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, digital transformation and, and what we're seeing across um, not just the region, um, but um, the entire UK as well. And um, what I'd like to do is before we start, pose a bit of a question to you all. And um, that is, what are the digital transformation adoption challenges that some of you are facing? I'd love to kind of understand more about that after this webinar, um, both through Q&A, but also kind of questions offline as well. Um, also to mention that this um, will be available as an article with all the reference points and resources available as well, because um, there's quite a lot to cover. Um, so we're going to be talking about digital transformation technology adoption. Um, of course, innovation is happening at a faster rate than ever before, um, and this has been further accelerated by COVID. Um, now, while on the face of it, that may seem like a good thing. The speed in which transformation is happening and the pressure surrounding it are creating environments where failure is becoming more prevalent. So that is something we've got to be careful about. Um, so we're going to explore some of those trends and discuss how we can adoption, adopt technology in the right way. So we look at some of those trends. The first one I want to look at is um, what I'm calling the, the need for speed. Um, I think this is by far the most important trend. Um, as all the other trends we're seeing were happening before the pandemic. Um, but it's just that they become now more important um, and are better understood. Um, but the speed in which you need to transform and adopt technology is moving at a faster rate than ever before in history um, for, for quite obvious reasons, of course. 
Um, and we can see that illustrated on this slide here by McKinsey and co. Um, we are seeing shifts in organizations using data, using insight and adopting technology across lots of, of different areas of their business. Um, and, and shifts happening from, you know, sometimes on an annual basis to quarterly, um, but the big shifts are happening for, for organizations shifting their needs um, and focusing on different areas of tech and digital from a quarterly to a monthly basis. Um, and across all organizations, um, they're assessing digital and tech um, from a COVID perspective on a weekly basis. And, and this is something we've not seen before um, across organizations, especially the ones and the members we're talking to around Birmingham Tech as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of highlight this, this quote um, because I, I thought it was quite a, a, a prevalent one, um, which is um, Elon Musk saying that um, technology isn't a static picture it is more like a, a movie and, and I think that's you know, you know it's, it's so true right now um you know it's moving at an acceleration we've, we've never seen before but there is there is hope in in kind of moving at that speed um you know I, I've kind of shown this this graph here that, that most of you will know crossing the the chasm um, now why am I showing this well actually there's a, there's a lot of insight um, and information we can take from the people who have gone before us so as I said some of this technology and digital adoption has already been delivered by you know, enterprise organizations and kind of mid-market organizations. It's now that the SMEs are, are kind of catching up with some of those, those tech companies. So there's a lot of different resources and content um, out there that we can learn from. Um, so I think my, my kind of lesson here is, is to kind of hit the pause button. Um, you know, there is a temptation during a pandemic um, and there still will be, you know, way after the, the pandemic to, to move really, really fast. And of course, moving fast is a good thing. Um, it can, you know, really benefit an organisation. It can enable you to go to market faster. It can enable you to kind of drive revenue into the organisation faster as well if you get it right. Um, but of course, the flip side of that is if you get it wrong, it can cause a whole array of problems. Um, so what's really important is to just understand the rationale behind why you are adopting that technology, why you're going through that digital transformation. Um, and, and ask yourself the question, will it improve customer experience? Will it improve revenue? Will it reduce costs, increase profitability or save time? Um, now, obviously, all of them, fantastic, great. Um, one or two of them, equally good. Um, but if you can't confidently answer those questions before you're going into some of these projects, then stop. Stop, hit the pause button and reassess. Look at the research and look at some of the insight that's backing up those assumptions that you may be having. Um, so the next one I want to look at is, is data. Uh, and of course, we've, we've kind of heard uh, some, some great examples there of, of how data can be applied to, to an organisation. And we're hearing this phrase more and more now, data is the, the new oil. And of course, there is a lot of money in kind of the good utilisation of data. Um, and yeah, we're, <laughs> we're seeing data being created at, at, a, at an accelerated rate. Um, you know, 90% of all the the world's data um, has been created, um, you know, in, in a small, finite um, period of time um, compared to the, the rest of history. And, and that actually is a, is a stat from a couple of years ago. You know, God only knows what, what that's like now. Um, so every day, every day we're creating this mass of data that, that can be utilised if you used in the right way. Um, but I'll stress that the can there. Um, and of course, yeah, data is, is one, one big problem. Um, and, and data is only good if you can extract the insight. And I think the message I wanna get across here is that there needs to be a shift from the buzzword around big data to one that focuses more on actionable insight, um, something that you can do and benefit your organization with. Um, so if we look at kind of some of the, the, the stats here from, from a number of, of organizations, um, you know, it, it can enable you to make those better strategic decisions, improve your processes, enhance 
customer insights and reduce reduction in the time it takes to kind of you know operate your your business um but it, it needs to be kind of you know utilized across your business processes and operations um and again yeah they're just just stressing that that kind of you know don't get seduced by the, the kind of big data buzzword and uh, make sure you're focusing on actionable insights so understand what you want to do with your data first um, and then once you know what you want to do with your data work towards creating platforms and integrated systems that allow you to extract that actionable insight in the right way. Um, so how do we kind of move towards actionable insight? Um, well, there's a, there's a couple of, of things you, you can do. Um, one is acquiring good sources of, of data. I see a number of organizations that, that kind of acquire data for the sake of it and and, and in sometimes in questionable terms as well um you know make sure that you're actually creating value exchanges with your customers so the data that's coming into your organization is something that actually can can deliver that insight um, and isn't just data for the sake of it and um, the other thing is to, to kind of democratize data across your organization and this is something we're seeing a lot of organizations now do um, especially actually over in, in silicon valley and um, making it more accessible um, both internally for your employees so employees can use it within their kind of internal projects and, and kind of you know create more innovation um, but also externally as well you know creating more trust with customers by making that data transparent and, and telling customers what you're actually going to do with their their insight and, and data um, i think that you know gdpr has, has created more awareness um, but actually kind of customers are still somewhat um, fearful of what organizations are doing with that, that data so it's important to you know err on the side of caution and be transparent as possible um, as well um, and decide yeah decide what you want to do with the data first make sure you've you've got that clear in your mind before you you know undertake a big kind of data project and of course we're, we're living in the the age of, of automation as as well so um you know if we are accelerating really fast and we're we're utilizing data in the right way then that can lead to a level of automation across our businesses as well um, so just looking at some of these ones and and we can look at these and kind of be be fearful um, but of course like any stat there is a, a kind of deeper story behind them um, but pwc saying there that kind of three percent of, of all jobs will be replaced uh, um over the next kind of 10 years now um of course that is um you know a, a worry um but i think it's not that those jobs won't be replaced at all um, I think that there'll be an emergence of new jobs um, around digital skills and um, that's something I know that the combined authorities want to are doing a lot around as well um, and then kind of the World Economic Forum there saying a reduction in full-time workforce um, again over the next kind of 10 years um, it, it's about making sure that each of our organizations are investing in the right digital skills upskilling our employees getting new people into the business with those digital skills um, and also kind of tapping into kind of retraining programs as well. Um, and of course, yeah, this this quote here, I, I love um, you are either the one that creates the automation or you're the one getting automated. Um, and that's someone who is, um, you know, probably one of the most well respected tech people um, in the world and a, and a multi billionaire. So, um, yeah, hopefully um, one we can kind of buy into there. Um, and I just wanted to make a, a kind of interesting, interesting point here as well. In a world of automation, um, what's really interesting is some of the jobs that are most resilient um, to being automated um, are the ones that are the, the lowest paid um, and the ones actually that we're going to become more reliant on. Um, in the next kind of 10 to 15 years you know teachers who are going to be actually getting across those digital skills healthcare workers and um, obviously kind of caring for an aging population um, and the, the creative arts and uh, you know people when we've got more time are going to be entertaining us so um, just an interesting kind of fact i thought i'd kind of put out there as as well 
Um, so, so again, what can we do around the, the automated recovery? Um, well, obviously, optimizing your business operations and getting them ready for optimi- um, automation is very important. Um, I think the most important one here is to start small. Um, don't become fearful that kind of automation is these big projects. A lot of automation can be delivered around kind of smart logic and decision trees. Um, so don't fear that actually it has to be kind of synonymous with machine learning or AI. Of course, that can be part of um, automation, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so most organizations can adopt a level of automation and ask for help. There's a lot of help out there as well. Um, so again, there kind of yeah, automation doesn't equals artificial intelligence or machine learning. So don't be fearful around that. Ask for help. Um, so I just wanted to highlight quickly um, a few regional opportunities. Um, so 5G um, has the ability kind of worldwide to generate 13.3, 13 13.2 trillion dollars. Um, now, something we, we should be really proud of in the West Midlands is we have the best 5G covery, coverage of any region in the UK. Um, so a big thanks to the team at West Midlands 5G there and their partners for the great work they're doing. Um, obviously there's a lot of talk about a green led recovery um and that again there's a lot of good work being done in the region by um, the west midlands innovation alliance and their low carbon working group and um, sustainability west midlands and a number of organizations um, including gbs lep um, and there's some great organizations emerging in that sector within the west midlands as well and um, edtech um, one that we heard about earlier uh, again, kind of massive impact there and um, within the West Midlands. And um, we're seeing organizations like Flash Academy, Oxbridge, Smartella and Employ all doing some great stuff. Um, FinTech, um, so this sector um, is delivering an estimated GBA of 411.7 million per annum to the West Midlands economy. Um, and that was a report um, by David Miller, actually, um, the FinTech report um, in collaboration with um, GBS LEP. Um, so that's an interesting one. And of course, that's being kind of driven by the new HSBC headquarters and um, the fintech hub with Velocity Accelerator and a number of others as well. Um, health tech, um, yeah, that's a, another area I'm not going to go into. I'll skip over a few of these, but um, there, there's some ones to, to focus on, certainly smart cities um, and then digital skills as well. Um, now, quickly, just to wrap up, the, the reasons to be optimistic. So um, we are seen as, as a growing tech hub um, and one that's becoming more prominent. Um, we've got a very diverse digital tech workforce um, and we are seen to kind of be a, a tech hub for some of these bigger organisations. So that's great. Um, but reasons for concern. Um, we are seeing a slowdown in the investment coming into the region um, and also a lack of, of scale ups. Um, so that is definitely a reason for concern and a decline in investment as well within the West Midlands, um, especially cons- and considering some of the increases in investment going into some of our comparative regions as well. So that is definitely an area for concern. Um, but fear not, help is at hand. So there's some great accelerators and business support programmes in the region. Um, and it's not just us that are kind of helping to connect the dots. There's also initiatives like the Grid and um, Innovation Alliance as well from the West Midlands, who are great resource hubs for some of this information um, and sharing as well. Um, and of course, the University of Birmingham um, have got some great programmes there. So there are eight of them um, which are well worth looking into um, to get help in a number of your initiatives. And I know Derek will kind of touch on a few of those. Um, and finally, yeah, it's time to level up. We need to create more scale ups. We need to kind of make sure that we're driving the digital economy across the region. Um, and that's why I'm so pleased to announce our new hub, which is coming soon. Um, so stay tuned and find out more about us by following us on Twitter and LinkedIn for some very um, soon to be um, revealed um, information and announcements. So thank you very much. Exciting times for everybody. Thank you very much, Yanis. No, that's absolutely fantastic. And um, the uh, Innovation West Midlands Innovation Alliance have also just put a link into their uh, low carbon working group um, on the uh, chat. So you can go and have a look at that. And also just to mention the uh, the 5G, the West Midlands 5G company recently had um, an Innovate UK funding call uh, that closed, I think, last week. So. I am hoping that that kind of call around 5G, around that kind of technology adoption uh, will be available um, in the coming years as well. Um, 
So that's really, really helpful. Thank you very much, Yanis. Um, and uh, yes, so I don't think we've got any, uh, oh, hang on, sorry, any questions in the, no, okie dokie. So what we're going to do, we have got only a couple of minutes. Um, Derek Sear has uh, pre-recorded his presentation slides and we won't have time for all of that now, but if Derek can just do a quick hello and an intro, we've got uh, two minutes, Derek, my darling, sorry about that. But what we will do is we will make available uh, his uh, full presentation online. So you have got time to watch that at your pleasure. Derek, if you wouldn't mind just doing a quick uh, hello sure. and introduction, that'd be super, thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, nothing like um, future planning on, on the off chance that you might run out of time. So yeah, the, um, the, the slideshow is pre-recorded. So um, if, you, if you really want to indulge in some um, demand hub humour, then by all means dive in. But ultimately, demand hub is the uh, university programme for, uh, essentially, it, it's a, a rebirth of what was an MD Tech programme. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring digital um, into the landscape of what we're offering. So it's very much about um, utilizing um, the data centric themes that we've got um, through the use of something like Pioneer, et cetera, um, which is available to us, which is uh, a UHB program, um, and use that to help accelerate whether it's a product, a service, um, whether it's regulatory or even app-based um, uh, medical device uh, projects. So um, my name is Derek Sear. Uh, if, if you could just go to the last slide, um, Ben, I, I think you're in control of this, um, it'll just throw on my email address. Uh, by all means, get in contact with myself directly. And um, hopefully, if, if there's uh, something there that you saw of interest, um, please, uh, please drop that email across. But um, yeah, I, Kate, fill in for two minutes is, is a tough call. I, I, I am no BBC One presenter, as you can tell. So um, yeah, no, I'll a, that back across to you. Thank you. No, you've done a grand job. And sorry that we ran out of time to do the full presentation. Um, those of you who have attended uh, the Business Club over the last year, over our webinars over the last year, rather, uh, Derek has talked before about the Demand Hub offer to business. So uh, hopefully repeat viewers uh, won't, uh, won't mind us skipping over that. But if you are new uh, to the Business Club and you, you do want to know more information about the Demand Hub, please do go online and have a look at that information. Thank you, Derek. So just to wrap up then, um, thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you very much to all our delegates for joining us on this cold and foggy morning. Um, just to let you know that the slides will be circulated and then the recording will be made available on our website. We will email you to let you know when that's live. Don't forget to join the Business Club on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter. Um, and our next webinar will be scheduled for next year, so in the spring 2021. Um, other events to note, um, please be aware that there is a Birmingham Chamber event on the 10th of December. Um, uh, yes, uh, their quarterly business briefing, which would be very useful, I believe, to everyone to find out what, where we are towards the end of the year. And also uh, VentureFest is coming back, which is gonna be great, and that's, of a, um, going to be a webinar on the 28th of January and again that's going to be really really useful to find out um, updates uh, from the West Midlands intermediaries from West Midlands universities from uh, funding sources like Innovate UK and other areas as well and also the pitch up competition which is available for startup um, entrepreneurial uh, people who are interested in pitching and hopefully receiving VC investment so keep an eye out for that information that's available. So there we go. Uh, we welcome your feedback. Thank you very much. These are events are as much for you as they are for us. And so we do value your feedback. Please do let us know uh, if you're interested in a particular topic uh, to hear about going forward. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next, next event in 2021. So Merry Christmas, everyone. And uh, see you in the new year. Thank you. Bye bye. Merry Christmas. <laughs> bye. Uh -huh. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.